Do you remember I mentioned that I was lucky enough to get into IIT Bombay? Yes. Uh, I was lucky. The number of great quality institutions in, in this country are very few. Even the rankings that the government publishes, which is the NIRF ranking, the university which is on the number 500, it is scoring only 25% out of the 100% scale. The number 500 is scoring 25%. On the government scoring scale, out of the hundred percent, which is the maximum. Of okay, and some and something something like an IIT Bombay, how much would that score? 80, 85, I would say. This is Indian government scoring. Yes, this is basically a government agency. How drastically is the quality dropping? Yeah. Essentially, so, it's like this drop, right? Like in the beginning, there are like these good institutions, and whoop, after like say fifty or the long tail years, is too big. It's really big. Uh, and don't forget, uh, startups have a hard time. Uh, when it comes to hiring great people. And they're always short of great people. Right. They're not short of people, they're always short of great people. And we are promising them great people. Hey everyone, welcome to the One Person Club show. As you can see, today we are not in my studio in Mumbai city. We've actually come to Bengaluru city. My favorite city, man. And I love coming back here. But this time, it's not just for uh, leisure and entertainment. It's actually to learn more about this new thing that I just discovered the Mesa School of Business. Now, when I heard about this, I was like, damn. When I was young, I mean, four years back, there was nothing of this sort, and I had to give the cat to get into a top IM college. I worked my ass off for it. I got a 98 percentile, but it was not enough. So clearly, there is a huge supply-demand gap for quality education in the world of management today. So I wanted to learn more about what is this Mesa School of Business. So I'm getting this opportunity to talk to one of the co-founders, Varun Limai. Hey, Sharan. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me here. Welcome to the Mesa School of Business. Thank you so much. And by the way, guys, Varun Lima is a graduate from the Kellogg School of Business, one of the top business schools in US. And I think the other co-founder is from the Harvard School of Business, who we'll be talking to very, very soon. So make sure to stick till the end. This episode is for someone who is thinking of getting into the world of management, getting into an MBA. So I'm sure most of you guys are thinking that. So let's learn more about what Mesa School does. So Varun, can you give us a quick walkthrough of what you guys are doing here? Uh, and why are we in a co-working space in the first place? We are in a WeWork, guys. So can you tell a little bit about that? Uh, we want to develop future startup leaders. And given that so many startups are originated in a co-working space, we felt that the entrepreneurial energy here was something that the students needed to experience. Right. So rather than we being situated far off from the heart of the city, we wanted to be in the heart of the startup capital of the country, which is Where are we right now in Bengaluru? This is WeWork Banargatta. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a WeWork campus. It has almost 100 plus startups. Wow. So our students not only get to interact with these 100 plus startups and a lot of fellow entrepreneurs who are trying to start companies, right. but the overall energy here is of hustlers, right? Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we wanted our school to be like. Yeah. And that's exactly why we have hosted it out of a co-working space. I think with most, uh, you know, MBA colleges, it's usually in the outskirts of a city yeah. and uh, it's usually like a separate ecosystem by itself, which exactly. is good. Like it has a lot of trees and, you know, very secluded from the city. But this here, the students feel like they're in the hustle and bustle of the city. And actually you talk to the entrepreneurs who are doing stuff in the startup world. Yep, yep. Can absolutely. you show me around? This absolutely. looks like a beautiful campus. Come, come, follow me. <laughs> so Sharon, these are what we call Mesa Pods. Support sounds like a very cool name. <laughs> what is what do they do? What do you guys do it for? Use so, it for? So when when students are learning, you know, unidimensional, unilateral learning is not the only way to learn. One of the most important ways to learn is actually work in groups and learn from each other. So when you mean unilateral, you mean one professor teaching to a group of students. Exactly, exactly. Just talking about a theoretical concept, students listening to it. That's that's not the right way to learn. Okay. There are so many students out there with varied experiences. Students should be learning a lot from each other right. by trying to solve a very, very common problem that's out there. And that's that's why what we have done is we have created these spaces where students can break out into, can can form groups. So how do you make these groups among students? Like how do you So that's that? randomly and, and okay. it's it's randomly done and we want it to be random because we want all our students to be interacting with many other students with yeah. varied experience. Will the groups change or is it like the same group throughout no, the No, no, it will keep on changing. And we have group work in every single lecture that we teach. Every single theoretical concept is okay. combined with a lot of group work that these students will need to do. Interesting. Can you tell me about this area? This looks like a very fans, fancy, chill area. It reminds me of the friend setup. <laughs> no, we we wanted a big uh, open area. We, we we like to treat this as the melting pot 
okay. of the startup <laughs> ecosystem. Uh, this is where students will come, they will settle down, they will talk to each other. Uh, for example, we do hackathons here. Okay. Uh, what, what is that? Like, is it like coding or coding or something? So, you know, hackathons need not be coding all the time. They could also be business problems. Okay. So, say for example, uh, our students get to lead teams, teams of UI, UX designers, product managers who are working in the startup ecosystem. Okay. And our, our students can work with all of these students to build something real in, in like two days. For example, they might build a prototype of a managed marketplace like say urban company. Uh, and, and maybe CXOs and startup leaders from these companies will come and will judge them on the kind of work that they have done. And so within, within two days, they'll have to build all of them. Exactly. That might mean not sleeping in the night. That might right. mean, uh, you know. So I'm trying to build a product for my company. I think it's going to take three months. I'm saying within <laughs> two days, you'll build something. Absolutely. And, and that's why we wanted this open space. There'll be a lot of events, a lot of startup CXOs and leaders coming down, getting their teams along. So okay. this is where our students get to network with these individuals. Uh, getting into a company requires a lot of networking, right? Yeah. It, it's not only your resume that can... I think most Indians are accustomed to getting spoon-fed with the placements, 100% yeah. placement. Everybody comes, within two days, everybody is placed. Yeah. So how do you um, want your students to kind of get the best jobs in the country? Yeah, it's, it's very simple. We, we, we like to keep it extremely personalized. So rather than we saying stuff like guaranteed placements, which, which sounds very marketing and gimmicky, what we do is we try to understand from these students what their target companies are. And we start talking to these target companies right at the start of the program. So the student will actually be talking to their target companies and people from their target companies and target roles on day zero. Okay. So in 12 months, they will be able to know a lot more about the company, about these individuals. And we are very, very sure with the network that we have in the startup ecosystem, they, they'll also be able to create these networks for themselves. How do you guys have that strong network in the startup ecosystem? What makes you guys so special? Three or four things. See, number one, we've been backed by Elevation Capital. So okay. they have portfolio companies which are 200 plus. Uh, so Elevation Capital, it's a, it's a VC. It's a VC. It's a VC. It, it's, it's, it's invested in KTM, Swiggy, Urban Company, Misho. Uh, we've got angel investors uh, who also have uh, really large companies. We've got Kunal Shah, we've got okay. Vijay Shekhar Sharma, we've okay. got Vidit Atre, we've got Abhiraj Bal from Urban Company. So they Can I also be an angel investor? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, so we've got that. And besides that, me and Ankit both have worked in this space for a while. Uh, I have my network at Kellogg. Yeah. Ankit has his network at IIT Bombay, Harvard Business School, Urban Company. And, and we are going to be tapping into this personal network that we have created for ourselves. And only 60 individuals are going to get that chance wow. uh, to, to tap into Just this. 60 students. That's all. That's one of the smallest batch size I've heard. That's all. That's all. And we want very, to very keep it small. Very, very focused then. Absolutely. Keep it small. Keep it extremely personalized. Mm -hmm. keep, it, keep it something that, that is extremely relatable, something yeah. that we can connect with. And that's, that's what our idea was. Can we see how where the 60 students will be sitting? Absolutely. Come follow me. <laughs> so, Sharan, this is the classroom. This is where students will get to learn. We wanted to keep it modular. So the classroom can change shape. It can break out into two separate classrooms. Okay. That's how we wanted our students to kind of absorb everything that we are going to be throwing at them. So you're also going to be teaching something? Yes, uh, I'm going to be teaching product management. Okay. Because I myself was a product manager at Amazon before wow. I started Mesa. Wow. So tell me Varun, if I am a student at Mesa school, how would my next 12 months look like? Like, am I going to be spending a lot of time uh, only here or is there a lot of things that are happening? So a lot of uh, industry practitioners, startup CXOs will be coming and teaching you. Okay. There'll be a lot of top academicians from uh, top business schools from India and globally coming down and teaching you. Okay. But to answer your question, uh, a student will spend only 25% or lesser of their time in the classroom. That's it, 25%. That's it, that's it. I mean, at least we felt that a lot of the learning happens outside the classroom and not only in the classroom. So I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, so for example, in the first term, students build a D2C brand from scratch. Can you uh, tell me what is the full form of D2C for the audience? Direct to consumer brand, okay. right? Uh, so it's a real business that they'll need to build in seven weeks. Uh, and, and that basically means that they'll need to build a website. They will need to choose a product to sell. They'll need to finalize a supplier. They'll need to brand that product. But where will they get the money for all of this? So we have started something called the five crore startup fund. Okay. So every one of these groups will get rupees one lakh to build four businesses, four micro businesses during their time 
at MESA. And, that, and, and we also provide other resources. For example, if they are going to be building websites, then we provide Shopify developers. Mm -hmm. If they need to run ads on Facebook to sell their product, then we are going to give them a digital marketing agency. Got it. So all of this, these resources that are required plus the mentorship that is required will be provided by us. Interesting. So what happens the remaining 75% of the time I'm outside the classroom? Absolutely. Where could I be? Give me an example. So for example, you'll be doing hackathons. Uh, you will be doing live projects with startups nearby, the way we have so positioned... So I'll have to probably go to their office and... Absolutely, the way we have positioned ourselves is... There so there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, variables here, like there's no hands-on, like it's not like you're holding my hands everywhere. Absolutely. I need to go out into the world and figure it out. Absolutely, no spoon feeding at <laughs> yeah, NASA. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and that's something that we completely believe in. Wow, interesting. So it doesn't sound like an easy program then? It's not, it's not, it's going to be very extensive. Uh, Students are going to be made uncomfortable. Yeah. At least we feel, believe that uh, once they are made uncomfortable when they, is, is when they will become comfortable in the real world. Damn, that sounds very, very interesting. Um, but I still have a lot of questions. Firstly, thank you for showing me what the student life looks like at MESA. Uh, but I want to go way deeper with you, Arun. I want to understand exactly who would be the right fit to join a program like this. And I'm sure a lot of our audience is also thinking uh, secondly, I would like to know what do you think is the future of business education in India? And thirdly, I also want to know how are you going to implement all of this, right? It's not just talking in the air, right? How are you actually going to pull this off? Absolutely. So I would also like to talk to your uh, other co-founder who is the Harvard Business School grad. So let's go. Shall, shall we go? Yes, let's go. So guys, now that we've seen what the campus is like, I wanted to kind of understand deeper about what Mesa School of Business is all about. So I prepared this big list of questions to ask the founders and this is one hell of an opportunity right because about three years back when I was uh, planning for my own uh, MBA I was reaching out to people from you know, colleges that you guys came from you know Kellogg and Harvard and um, if anybody replied to me I'm like oh my god I'm getting a call with them to learn about my own career and to have both of you you know together to answer my questions and for the audience is going to be really really uh, you know enlightening and uh, very value adding for for each of our own professional journey. But I want to start off uh, with you, Ankit. Uh, by the way, he's the other co-founder I was talking about, Ankit Agarwal. And he has a pedigree which is kind of out of this world, right? He is from IIT Bombay. And he, after that, he went to Harvard Business School. And his wife also did the same. So my first question to you is, which planet are you from? Whichever planet my wife is from. <laughs> So can you walk us through your professional career, like what did you do in IIT and after that at HBS? Can you just walk us through your life? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, I was lucky to get into IIT Bombay. My parents wanted me to be a doctor. Okay. Uh, they were slightly disappointed, but then I think they were happy afterwards. Um, Same story, by the way. My parents also wanted me to be a doctor. So I think went to IIT Bombay, um, was surrounded by really, really smart folks, really driven folks, made some of my... Uh, Where did you study there? Uh, mechanical engineering. I did my bachelor's and master's. Okay. Uh, it was a package deal. Okay. Uh, five years. Yes. Six years worth of degrees in five years. Who would refuse that? Uh, and uh, but I mean I I think very early on realized that uh, mechanical is not something or engineering is not something that excites me. Uh, so got a chance to get involved with some of the other parts of the world. Um, they had a very active entrepreneurship cell, which I became part of and then ultimately ended up leading that. And that sort of you know. Uh, exposed me to the world of entrepreneurship for the first time. And I think I do think that is what has seeded every other decision in my life. Um, and, you know, I, I'll, I'll take you down a bit of a trip down the memory lane. This was back in 2007, 8. The only two mainstream entrepreneurs that we had in India at that point were uh, Narayan Murthy and his company, which is Nanda Nilkani, and maybe Make My Trip, you know. Uh, there were no other big consumer companies uh, back then. So we were still trying to understand what the word entrepreneur meant. Um, then after IIT, I uh, went to BCG, uh, became a consultant there, was there for two years. So BCG is one of the top three consulting firms in the world. We like to think of ourselves as the top one. Right. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think that, that baton keeps on shifting. Um, but yeah, I think that was a great job uh, out of campus. So Learned what did you exactly do there? Like everybody loves word word management consulting, right? And we discover this word when, when we are starting to get interested in MBA. Nobody really knows what it is. I was also a management consultant. And when most people ask me to explain, 
even I'm not able to explain properly what we do. So how would you explain what you did as NBC? Uh, it's actually a tough question. So I took more than 100 flights in those two years. Wow. Because I was traveling to wherever the customers or clients were. And whenever somebody, I think people used to be much more chatty 10 years back on the flights. They would always ask you, what do you do? Right. And uh, I would tell them that I work in BCG. And then I'll tell them I'm a management consultant. And they'll ask me, what does that mean? So usually it took me the rest of the flight to explain it to them. So over the years, I've actually gotten better at explaining what management consulting is. Um, in, in a very short line, it's about helping companies take on the biggest problems that they face. Uh, now, th these problems can come in all shapes and forms. I'll give you a couple of examples. Maybe a company is trying to improve the efficiency of their manufacturing plant. Uh, maybe they are trying to understand what should be the right strategy to grow 10 times in the next five years with a new product in a new geography. Uh, maybe they are trying to understand what should be the right organization structure uh, to create the best sales experience, both internally and externally. Uh, but ultimately the name management consulting is you work with the management of the companies and consult them on these problems. Now, the idea is that you actually consult them. Uh, you're not the ones who is implementing it. So you get involved, but you're not the one on the ground implementing it. Uh, and hence the word management consulting. Right. Uh, post BCG, I had an offer to join HPS in their MBA program, but then I decided to defer it. I wanted to try. Oh, you were one of those HPS 2 plus 2 programs. Yes. Yeah. That is the gold standard. I don't know if that's the gold standard, <laughs> but uh, I mean, I was lucky to again get into it. Uh, did, did provide a bunch of safety net for me uh, and allowed me to experiment. Um, so then I deferred that. And I so you worked for two years and then instead of going to HBS, you deferred it further? Yes. I requested them, can I not come this year? Okay. And they said, yes, why not? Okay. Um, so yeah, I decided to start something with a couple of friends from IIT. Uh, we wanted to disrupt the handicraft exports value chain in the country. We were all from Rajasthan. We saw that it's a $10 billion annual export. We were very irritated and frustrated by how broken it was. Uh, we tried that for around one and a half years. We failed miserably. Uh, that was a different time in the country. Ten years ago, startup ecosystem wasn't as mature or as evolved as it was. So there was there weren't a lot of mentors or guides around us. And maybe we were also not that, that that clear on who to reach out to and what to ask. Then I worked at a non-profit in education for a year uh, called Pratham. That's where Varun and I met actually and became friends. Um, I went to education because a lot of my family is in Rajasthan. Uh, they are actually government school teachers. Uh, so for some reason, I was I got an overdose of education growing up, okay. and I always wanted to be you know uh, to be doing something in education. So I thought let me try with nonprofit. Uh, then after a year at Pratham, uh, decided to again defer okay. uh, HBS, and they said no. <laughs> so uh, they said either come or don't come, <laughs> and I said I can't say no to HBS. So I ended up going to HBS again. Two years of fantastic experience. Uh, surrounded by great driven individuals. I think the, the way they have designed the experience is phenomenal. They really put you out of comfort zone. Somebody who moved from India, I think it took me like three months to settle down. Okay. Uh, I mean, the new country, you know, uh, new way of doing things. Um, and their rigor on academic excellence is just phenomenal. Um, the kind of people that they're able to select and fill the class with is just phenomenal. And I think you learn as much from faculty as, as you learn from your peers. And I think their case study method is just amazing. Uh, so spent two years there. I was very clear that I wanted to be back in India. Um, you know, you make a lot of friends in two years. Uh, so it was, a, again, a bittersweet moment for me. But Pani Puri in India is too good. That's what you told me. Earlier. Yes, uh, yes. Pani Puri is just... So he left US and HBS. After all of that, he came back to India to eat Pani Puri. <laughs> I mean, you can't, I mean, try to find Pani Puri in US, it didn't work. So I, I never applied for a visa there. Uh, I didn't want to create those, you know, you, some, you know, some may call them golden handcuffs, right? Yeah. I said, I want to be clear. I want to be back in India. Like investment banking jobs and all are like golden handcuff jobs. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, I mean, they, those jobs are so good. They pay like on, on average 300K a year, right? Yeah, I think including everything. Good, you can, and a half crores yeah, per you year. can easily get that amount of money. Uh, and it's a great job. But it's not something which I wanted to uh, do. I wanted to be building things, wanted yeah. to be, you know, uh, building things in India. So I ended up joining a healthcare company in US, which was expanding in India. So I thought that was a good combination where I can work in a space which is underserved, unsolved, and still be in a zero to one setup. Right. Uh, so I moved here with them, tried to build their business here. Uh, we tried that for a few years, realized that 
It's not something which is very exciting for a large Fortune 200 company in US. So we ended up selling our Indian business to an Indian competitor. And that's when I uh, started looking at opportunities again. Uh, and this was back in 2018. And I realized that the startup scene in India is just, you know, uh, just crazy. Okay. And um, I met Abhiraj at Urban Company. Uh, actually, my wife was also working there. So that's how we met. And, uh, you know, we, you know I, just, I was just really amazed by their vision, mission, the quality of people that they were able to attract, the challenging problem that they were trying to solve. And I just saw myself doing that. Um, ended up joining Urban Company, was there for almost four years. Um, you know, they have an amazing culture there. They were able to provide me with the right space to make mistakes, learn, grow personally and build the business. And um, yeah. I come from a sporting family. Okay. So my father actually played Ranji Trophy cricket, was in the, oh. was in the Mumbai side, which also had Vingsarkar, Gavaskar, Tendulkar and so on and so forth. Your dad played with all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a leg spinner. Okay. Um, and so, so for me, it was very clear that there is only one career in life, which is become a sportsman. Uh, I pursued badminton. I played badminton at a national level. So I did not know anything outside of badminton. No, why not cricket though? Uh, I tried cricket, but I pretty much fell in love with badminton. That was also the time when Pulela Gopichand had won the so All. Were your parents also disappointed, like his parents? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> my my father was, my mother wasn't, but my father definitely was because uh, he wanted. Uh, me to be a cricketer right. but but that did not come true uh, so yeah pretty much uh, I, I joined engineering college uh, because my friends joined that engineering college Which was know, this? this was father agnil's washi it's it's okay. uh, it's a college in washi i, I did mechanical engineering Where from is washi? washi is in navi mumbai uh, okay, navi it's mumbai. It's, uh, it's the <laughs> other side of mumbai <laughs> it's it's pretty clean it's the second most uh, cleanest city in the in the country um, so i i spent four years there uh, got injured and that's when I, you know, there was a need to kind of look outside of sports. Uh, at that point of time, did not know what I wanted to do with my life. So the first company that came on campus was Larson and Dubrow. Mm. But as uh, destiny, what did you study in engineering? Uh, I I did mechanical engineering. Both of you are mechanical engineers. Even most, I am a mechanic. It's the most important engineering. So when, when you're <laughs> entering engineering, you're told this thing that mecha mechanical is evergreen. Yeah, I was also told. That. <laughs> So, uh, so I entered with that kind of uh, image that it's, it's going to be evergreen. So, Lassen and Tubro, I ended up working there as a procurement engineer. Now, as Destiny had it, uh, it, was a, it, it wasn't the most interesting job. It was pretty boring. It was not a lot of intellect that I needed to use. But there was one skill that I developed there that I still carry on with me, which is communications and stakeholder management. So, so I ended up working with a lot of different departments. Uh, each one of them had different goals, incentives. So ended up like, you know, smoothening my communication skills, which still kind of helped me even today. Uh, so spent around one and a half years at Lassen and Tubro. As, like any other engineer, even I wanted to then you know, wear a coat, go to the IIMs, probably work for a consulting firm and... So how much, like most people after MBA, um, for example, me, um, we were getting like 4 to 5 lakh CTC post, uh, yeah. so from, from mechanical engineering. Yeah. How much was... 3 lakhs, income? 3 lakhs. 3 lakhs. So it was 3 lakhs and then... So was the primary motivation to go, do an MBA was the low pay or what was the reason for I think, doing I think MBA? it was a couple of things. Number one was that at least I felt like many individuals out there that I could do more um, because my, my, my strengths, my talents weren't being utilized to, to their maximum potential. So that's why I felt that I needed to do more. And, and, the, and, and when I, I feel that when people are lost, the definition of want to do more is very unidimensional when it comes to the Indian ecosystem, which is MBA, MBA yeah. right? Uh, so you prepared for the CAT? I prepared for the CAT. Uh, and so, so right after last night too, bro, I gave the cat okay. and I scored 99.86 percentile. Uh, first attempt. First attempt, I scored 99.86 percentile, pretty much like. So all ABC would have called. Yeah, hit it out of the park. So unfortunately, that did not happen. Uh, because at that point of time, when ABC, ABC was selecting people, they used to take into consideration standard 10 scores, standard 12 scores and graduation scores. Now, as it turned out, because I was from Mumbai University, the scoring in general in Mumbai University is very, very low. So I, I scored like amongst the top 10%, but still it wasn't enough for ABC to give me a call. Wow. Uh, and, and that was like a, a, a rejection. And I thought I was the unlucky guy, getting 98 percentile and not getting into I Yeah, so th that was a rejection that, that was difficult to digest. Uh, it kind of told me that 
what is it that I would need to do to kind of break out of this pool of undifferentiated people that I was amongst. Uh, I needed to differentiate myself and I knew that I needed to do something drastically different and suddenly uh, I had, I had once I scored 99.86, I had almost envisaged that the next five years would be me studying in an IIM, you know, getting a great job, earning a lot of money and suddenly that had like shattered. Yeah. Uh, but took a step back, realized that at the end of the day, I wanted to do something differentiated that, that could differentiate me from the rest of the crowd. Uh, during preparations for the remaining IIMs, uh, where I had gotten interview calls from, so I started reading a lot about it. Which college called you? So all the IIMs besides IIM ABC gave me a call. Okay. But once I had scored 99.86, I did not yeah. want to go for uh, Makes sense. Yes, the, I agree. any of the IIMs besides the top three. So, so I decided let's do something fundamentally different. Uh, became somewhat of a rebel and I said that, no, yes, I've not kept anything. Let's do something completely different. So, so I decided to join a non-profit. Okay. It turned out to be a good decision because I met uh, I met my man on the same left. Pratham, same. Yeah, same uh, uh, right company. there, Pratham Education Foundation. Traveled a lot. The first year, I I had written an, uh, a letter to the CEO. She felt that I I had energy but did not have the right level of maturity. So she made me travel for an entire year. Mm. Post that year, I joined this department called Measurement, Monitoring, and Evaluation. Okay. It was one of those departments at Pratham which used to combine data, technology and education. So, so I found myself at the mix of something super interesting. Uh, that's where me and Ankit met. We worked together for a year. Then Ankit left for Harvard Business School. I continued. Uh, I, I built out that unit. I grew oh, it was from... This like, was, did you find uh, the work exciting? At this very time? exciting. In yes, fact... Because I had a question here, right? Because when most people think about their career, at least in India, we are very, very focused on salary being the top priority. Yeah. Now, when we hear, this is just me, I don't know if everybody feels this, when you hear not-for-profit, we inherently assume that if it's a not-for-profit company, will they pay me a high salary? So, what was the motivation for the both of you to work at a not-for-profit company? I think at least for me, uh, you know, what I was over-indexing on was the quality of work and the quality of experiences that it would give me. I think I was pretty confident that uh, with the potential that I had, if I had the right amount of skills and the experiences, I could earn money in the future. Mm -hmm. But these were my formative years uh, right out of college. So I wanted these years to be very, very rich when it came to experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's what Pratham gave me. I, I traveled 22 states, wow. almost 300 different districts in a span of four years, worked with district commissioners, worked with sarpanches of villages, with government teachers. So I saw all different kinds of customer personas and I was building products for them. So it made me very strong in kind of understanding who the customer is, what the problem is and how I can tailor my products to kind of, you know, satisfy whatever their needs are. So spent around four and a half years there, wanted to now see the other side of the world. I had seen the non-profit world, I had understood what the challenges are, now wanted to see the for-profit world. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did my application, scored well in the GMAT, how got, did you score? I got 740. Sanford. Which is which is okay. It's 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 not like great, but it's I had not given enough it. to get uh, like scholarships. Yeah, scholarships are dependent on GMAT. So yeah. I I got uh, an okay scholarship, but but not the best one. And uh, ended up studying at the Kellogg School of Management. Wonderful two years. Which is again like a M7 school, right? It's an M7 top school, seven school. Top seven school it allowed me a chance to really take a step back because I had gotten like really hands on with what I was doing. This gave me a chance to ask myself like really fundamental questions like. What is it that I wanted out of my life? Uh, you know, what is my what what was my inner compass like pointed towards? Of course, uh, uh, Ankit was a very good mentor at that point of time. Used to ask him a lot of questions about what's right, what's wrong. So we kept chatting with each other uh, right from the beginning. And then, of course, then I chose the other spectrum of nonprofits, which has ended up working with Amazon. Yeah. Uh, worked there as a senior product manager first in Seattle, then moved to Mumbai. Uh, and and then post that, uh, me and Ankit started talking. Uh, we had been Before talking. Before we get to the Sorry. part about uh, Mesa, um, I'm very curious to know because most people who go to you know US for higher education, uh, we go with a lot of risks, right? Because there's a humongous loan that we take, especially for an MBA, right? Um, last I checked for my uh, when I got into Columbia Business School, it was a two hundred thousand yeah. uh, dollar tuition fee for which you'll have to take a loan, one point five crores. Now, of course, as a person from a middle class family, I'll open my Excel, see the ROI, how much salary I'll make there, how what is the payback period, and it's around four and a half years. So when I was planning to go to US from MBA, I was 
like 100% four or five years, I have to work because I have to make back the money. Yeah. In with an Indian salary, it's going to be impossible to make 1.5 CR. So, what gave you that courage to come back to India in such a short time period? Like, what was it? So, I would say a couple of things. I would say one thing that was practical is that. Uh, if you work a couple of years in the US and if you if you very stringently save, there's a good chance that you'll be able to pay off 70 to 80 percent of your loan. Okay. Uh, that's what I ended up doing. Uh, that That's number one. Number two is uh, moving from the US where you're getting the salaries that they are, uh, the, the, the life that is there in the US which is super comfortable and moving to India is is not a practical decision. It's it's an emotional decision. It has to have some kind of seeds within you that that you know that existed there for a really long time. At least for me, it was when I was at Pratham and I was traveling a lot. I I think I understood what I wanted to do from my life uh, when I had built products that that you know government teachers were using and when when I saw the joy on their face when the problem was solved, it used to give me that kick and I was very very sure that that's the kick that I wanted to have for the rest of my life. Uh, I, I wanted to build for the Indian consumer. Uh, so when I realized at Amazon that I was spending almost 80% of my time trying to understand the American customer, I was like, this is a learning curve that I don't need. And that's why I felt I came back to India. It was a safe option. I came back to India with Amazon. So I was still earning good amounts of money that allowed me to pay back my loan. How much was it then when you came back to India? Uh, the loan amount? The pay, the salary. So the the pay is usually, I would say, the half half of what you would get there once you multiply the dollars and so on and so forth. So I was getting somewhere around one CR. In India. In India. Uh, the Amazon pays one CR in India for senior product managers. Yes. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so it's 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 a good salary. I mean, if you can move to India um, and have a good team, it's it's worth working at Amazon. So from there, how did you guys? Uh, eventually catch up because you guys were working together at the not not for profit uh, organization called Pratham. You went to Harvard, you went to Kellogg. Then how did you guys come back together and decide to start something? There was no coming back because we were always in touch. Like I used to look up to Ankit as a mentor. So any decision that I took, hey, should I go to Kellogg? Hey, I'm planning to come back to India. I remember that conversation that we'd had. He was, I think, going to Pune. He was in a car. And I was asking this question. And in fact, this line that he had said that moving from US to India is an emotional decision was his line. Uh, so we were in touch always, we were always like brainstorming ideas, okay, this is what we needed to do. Both of us knew that entrepreneurship was the final destination. So I, I, I think it was a matter of time uh, that, that we were going to start something. Yeah, I think for me it was also, um, I think time where I started thinking about, I mean things were doing going fine at UC, I mean they were going great actually. UC was doing great, I was doing great at UC. Um, Sorry, what is UC? Urban Com. Urban Com. Yeah, yeah. I mean, after spending four years, you start shrinking some words. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I think so. Things were great, right? And uh, there was no reason to change, honestly. But uh, you know, when things are great, you have some time to reflect, and uh, that's when I think it all started coming back to me as well. That why did I want to come back to India in the first place? Why did I start something ten years ago? What is my long-term aspiration? And I think it all boiled down down to the idea that uh, I want to build things and I want to create more and more impact. And uh, while UC did provide that opportunity for a very long time, I felt that um, I could do more outside of UC. And uh, I never thought about joining another company. I felt that UC was the perfect spot for me. Um, so the only other option was to do something of my own, uh, where I felt I could actually pick out a very meaningful problem, uh, which is worth solving. Dedicate a lot of time and energy in solving that. And hopefully if it works, we've made a difference. So that is the first step towards starting yes. your own company, yes. finding a problem that you want to solve. No, the first step is committing to it. Okay. Uh, okay. So, you know, a lot of people told me that you should first moonlight and uh, find an idea or a problem, uh, build an MVP. And I think that works for some people. For me, I think it was more about commitment, uh, emotionally, mentally, physically, that I'm in this journey. Uh, because it is a journey, right? It's not yeah. a two month thing. It's not yeah. a two year. I mean, you. Have, I had to think about it's you know, about this decision from a 10 year horizon. Yeah. So I and said that. The first two, three years is complete war, right? Right. You're not seeing, you can't even see the, the ray of light coming out. No, it's, it's just you and your energy. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I had to commit myself. I decided that if I can't commit myself, how can I ask others to commit? Uh, so I left UC, uh, took some time out. I have a two year old son, so spent some time with him. Uh, and uh, that's when I started thinking about what's the next step. And the next step for me was not the idea. 
because I I've also learned it from you know for example Abhiraj and Varun are great mentors at Urban Company, uh, and I'm very inspired by their stories. So they also came together as friends, and they they said that we want to build something, we want to change the world, and then they started looking at the problem spaces. So I wanted to follow that journey. So I I, I felt that the person that I do it with is actually significantly more important uh, at that point versus the problem that I picked. So I thought very hard about uh, who do I want to call, and uh, I called Varun. Okay. Varun, uh, and I think he also got some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got uh, some indications because usually what we used to do is we used to talk like once a month, or maybe like once every three months. But this time he was very adamant. Hey, we need to talk. We need to talk. And I'm like, listen, we talk once every three months. Like, what's happening now? And I, I, I told my wife. I think Ankit is starting something. And if he asks me to join, I'm going to say yes immediately. So I'd act, I'd actually aligned my family that I'm going to quit Amazon if I, if he asks me that we are going to start something. Uh, then I got the call. And my first question to him was, "What's the idea?" And he was like, "No, you first quit your job, <laughs> and then we'll figure it out." And that's what I did. So that's when you know he moved to Bangalore from Mumbai, um, and we started thinking about the problems we want to solve. Uh, that so you guys quit jobs first, then started thinking about the problem. Yes. Wow. I mean, we wanted to be very sure of the problem that we pick, because as I, I mean, as as um, you know, as I as I mentioned earlier, it's a ten-year journey, right? So ideas change. But you have to be convinced about the problem that you're solving is worth solving, because there there will be too many days where things are not going your way. So what will motivate you, right? Um, so the only thing that is going to motivate you is the idea that you're solving something, you're doing something meaningful, and that is where the choice of problem becomes very important. Uh, and that's why we want you to take our own sweet time. Um, we were not in a rush. I mean, we had enough financial cushion, thankfully. Yeah. We had support of our family, um, our spouses. So I think we're lucky that way. Uh, that gave us the right um, runway to think about this properly. And only time will tell if if we if we did things right. But I think so far we feel that you know. Uh, so what is the problem that you're, that you finally figured out that you guys want to solve? I think the problem is very broad. I mean, I think so. We both gravitated very naturally towards education because we were very passionate about that as a problem and. Um, and when we realized that there's a lot more to be done, we said that this is what we need to do. So when we started going deeper, we started talking to a lot more, you know, customers and then potentially, you know, stakeholders. We we realized that we want to focus more on the higher education, right? And higher education is anybody who has finished class 12, so like 17, 18 years of age, to 28 to 30 years of age. That's basically the first 10 years of their professional life, including the undergraduate years. That's when they learn the most amount of professional skills, vocational skills, uh, hard skills, soft skills, networking, everything and anything that is going to allow them to build a successful professional life in the next 30 years, 30 years to 60 years, right? Um, so we we felt that that piece is pretty broken right now. Why is it broken? Do you remember I mentioned that I was lucky enough to get into IIT Bombay? Yes. Uh, I was lucky because every year I think just for IIT Bombay. Or IIT, uh, I think last I remember maybe five lakh and more, you know, chill, uh, you know, uh, students are applying every year. Five lakh people are applying. Yeah, I, is, giving the test. This is the advanced exam or the? I think the J. I I don't even know. Like I, I gave it like twenty years ago. Okay. I didn't want to declare how old I am, but you made me declare that. I think the number of great quality institutions in in this country are very few. If you look at the ranking that the government publishes, we have around thirty to forty thousand universities in the country. Okay. And uh, if you look at the government ranking, which is the NIRF ranking, uh, the thirty to forty thousand universities and how many students go to these thirty to forty thousand? Every year, around seventy to eighty lakh students are graduating. Every year in India. In India, and Indian government is actually trying to push this number to double of this. Okay. This is actually a fraction of people who graduate twelfth class. Okay. Um, so really, I, how much people graduate twelfth class? I think if I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's at least three to four times of this. Okay, so three to so around three four crores graduate twelfth standard, and then from that seventy eighty lakhs graduate finish, in this uh, yeah, higher education. Yeah. Now, if you think about the number of great quality institutions, you can actually count them on maybe two hands. Okay. Uh, around fifteen twenty. Around twenty to thirty, right? Uh, even the rankings that the government publishes, which is the NIRF ranking, uh, if you look at the thousand, the 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 university which is on the number five hundred, 
it is scoring only 25% out of the 100% scale. Uh, Sorry, the number 500 is scoring 25%. On the government scoring scale, out of the 100%, which is the maximum. Of okay, and some and something something like an IIT Bombay, how much would that score? 80, 85, I would say. This is Indian government scoring. Yes, this is basically a government agency uh, okay. scoring. Uh, and uh, so imagine if the quality is like how how drastically is the quality dropping? Yeah. So Essentially, it's like this drop, right? Like in the beginning, there are like these good institutions and whoop. After like say 50 or... The long tail is too big. It's really big, right? And what is the reason for this situation? I mean, it's very hard to dissect it in hindsight. But uh, I mean, at this point, I mean, we can only answer what is happening now, right? Why is it not improving now? I think one, um, I strongly believe that there are no incentives in the system to improve. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the incentive for a private small college in a small city to really invest in the learning experience of the students. Um, I think we as students and parents are also to be blamed because we got into this race to get more and more degrees without really holding them accountable for uh, outcomes, both you know tangible and intangible. Um, most of the institutions are, I mean, I think we are not allowed to have for-profit institutions in higher education or any education for that matter. So that does you know, remove the, the invisible hand of market forces, right. which automatically removes bad performers and rewards good performers. So I do believe that's also partly true or, or has a role to play. Um, and I think we just expanded too fast. So over the last 10, 15 years, the number of new educational institutions that have come up is preposterous. It's very high? It's yeah. very high. So I think if you think back 15, 20 years ago, um, because of this BPO and IT boom, a lot like a lot of people realize that there are a lot of new jobs uh, when you become engineers and IT engineers. So a lot of new engineering colleges came up. Um, and uh, in fact, we are oversupplied. So in engineer, we have around 16 lakh seats in engineering right now, only 50% get filled every year. Sorry, can you repeat that? So right now the capacity for engineering education in India is double of what is needed as of now. So there are so many new colleges that have opened up uh, and they opened so fast that I don't think we, we were able to control the quality. Uh, and now actually government is trying to not renew uh, all expiring um, approvals of colleges which are not performing well because they're trying to shrink the number of seats. So I think we have around 15 to 16 lakh engineering seats every year and only seven to eight lakh are getting filled. Um, and uh, I think we just, you know, increased it too fast also. So the quality became a problem. So now if you look at, let's say today, in today's world, uh, in India's today's world, uh, if engineering is the middle of the funnel for being very, very rich in life, uh, the bottom of the funnel today has become, let's say an MBA degree. Now you're saying that 16 lakh engineers are being minted every year. Eight lakhs. Eight lakhs engineers are being minted every year. Uh, and all of them, like for example, look at the three of us, right? All of us engineers, all of us want to do an MBA, right? So do you think that the MBA, is there a bubble in the MBA ecosystem or is there a significant lack in seats in quality MBA colleges? How can you fix this problem of um, higher population of engineers in the middle of the funnel? Is MBA the only route or are there other routes that they can take? I think there are other routes and they should take those routes. Um, so out of the engineering, I mean, if you think about seven, eight lakh graduates every year, only two to three lakh graduates are getting IT jobs. You know, in this, these big companies like Infosys, Wipro, SCL. These are the best paying companies. These, not the best paying companies, but these are like volume jobs. So volume. they would come and like hire almost half the campus, right? And, uh, and thank God for that, because you know, otherwise we'll have a big unemployment problem. Right. Uh, beyond that, you have some jobs where, you know, from the top colleges where they can go into either great engineering jobs, let's say Tata Motors and all of that, uh, or they can get into non-engineering jobs like, you know, data analytics, banking, consulting. For example, I went to BCG after doing an engineering job. But again, those jobs are not a lot. Now, what happens to the others, right? Why do people want to do an MBA? I think Varun did mention, right? So when people feel that they can do more and they are not getting the right opportunities, which also translates in some ways the value that they're able to capture in terms of compensation, they think of the next step. 
So I'll, I'll tell you something which uh, a relative of mine said a few weeks ago. Um, that cousin of mine had done his um, engineering from a tier two college, right? But he was not able to find a job. So his father, uh, my relative called me and asked me, Ankit, uh, how can we find him a job? I said that there are several jobs he can get. But then he said, no, but they don't pay as much. Uh, then I asked him, what is more important? Getting a job, learning on the job and growing, or waiting for a dream job, which will never come. Yeah. Then he said that, should I get him admitted to an MBA school? Hmm. Um, and uh, I think, <laughs> So that's the mentality we have, right? We don't want to do the jobs we have. We feel that we deserve more without having learned enough. Yes. And we think that there's a shortcut because we see maybe top 20 colleges or you know some news article in a in on the front page that this girl from IMX got two crore package and everybody just wants to be that person, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's not the reality. The reality is that there are again the same thing is getting repeated in the MB colleges. You have 3 lakh seats in MBA every year. Now, the same distribution of quality of college is there. You have some great institutions. Uh, you have some mediocre institution. But the majority of institutions are just giving you a degree. Uh, you actually spend two years of your life in the prime of your life, which is formative, where you should be actually doing stuff, learning, making mistakes. You sit inside a class and listen to lectures. Yeah. You while away. Uh, some money which you don't have, either it's your parents or you've taken it on a loan and then you spend the next few years trying to pay it back. Right. Uh, if you were lucky enough to get a job. I don't think that's the only option today. Uh, what you can and should do as a young professional is to try to get a job. Uh, and there are jobs in, in sales, there are jobs as data analyst, there are jobs in retail, there are jobs um, as customer service specialist, uh, there are jobs in new age companies and startups. Uh, you can get into a banking relationship jobs. Um, and obviously you will have to invest a little extra because your college or undergrad didn't prepare you for those jobs. But there are enough ways for you to do that. I would say invest in that, get into a job. Then you will also realize what you're good at, what you're not good at. And then at that point of time, if you, if you think that I need to go for an MBA, you will actually be in a much better position to take that decision and you will actually get into a better MBA school as well. Interesting. So today, if you see, I mean, all startups today, or let's say the India story, right? People are saying we are now the most populated country in the world. And um, the average, um, what do you say, disposable income is going to increase. Uh, but I always had this doubt, how is it going to increase if people are not going to get higher paying jobs? Because if the education system is not fixed, right? If, you're, if we are saying that the quality of education is bad if you look at the long tail and only the handful few colleges are providing good quality education that would invariably also mean that a large number of people are not going to get your high paying jobs or the double paying jobs unless they get into an MBA. Now same story with MBA as well only a handful few, few colleges give you that 20 lakh plus kind of jobs most of them are going to get you that I don't know 6-7 lakh. So my question is how exactly are we saying that India is going to get richer from a you know per uh, person level if the education system is not fixed for them to earn those higher income? No, no, I think it's going to be almost impossible. Uh, currently, we have four or five major streams of undergraduation, right? You have either engineering, you have uh, either you can do a BCom or a BCA or a BA or a BSc, right? Th these five is 90% of your undergrad. Uh, let's say engineering is maybe 10% and everything else is maybe 15 to 20%. And then you have some medical law, which makes up, you know, a long tail of the last. So BCom is the 70-80%? BCom is actually 25-30% of that 80 lakh number. Okay. Uh, then there's another BA, B, BCA and BSc that makes the other. That is Bachelor uh, of Science. Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of uh, Computer Application. This is another 20-30. Yeah. So engineering is actually only 10% okay. of your annual graduates. Medical is actually less than 2% mm -hmm. of your annual graduates. Um, so maybe 50 years ago when these, these programs were created, uh, they had a direct job linkage. So if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, learning science, then they can actually do something in science. If they are learning uh, something in, in commerce, then they'll actually do something in commerce or business. But now these programs are completely disconnected from the real job. If you ask somebody uh, who has done a BCom 
to actually do sales like there is no job which a bcom person can get directly yeah uh, because the curriculum is almost 50 years old um why the, do people do it why do what else do they, they don't they have don't, an option like there's no they don't option. have an option right uh, why is there only five options in undergrad engineering bcom and medical and bsc why is there nothing else in india there are now new options you know being available um, so there are two three things here one i think we haven't yet fully convinced ourselves that we can live without degrees but we can't live without skills i think we are still in the other world where you need at least some degree yeah. like some paper from the government that okay degrees are still your primary signal to the world that you are worth something you're right, right. um uh, but that is changing you know especially covid actually accelerated a lot of that where people realized that people without going to college either learned or didn't learn. yeah uh so what is this degree yeah right um so let's focus on skills right uh, so that will take some time to change in fact my team uh for the company that i run uh is filled with 22 23 year old uh people and all of them you know not from fancy colleges they just focused on their skills yeah and they are they are they have the skills which your 30 plus people will never ever focus on yeah. basically they are upskilling themselves on the new ai tools which are Absolutely. coming up yeah. and they are the people that you need today so yeah. i don't even look at degrees these days it's just the skill set that i'm looking exactly. at but the problem there is how do we do the screening right because when it's a degree i put a filter iit i just get iit people on let's say linkedin but for skills how do i stand out as a candidate to get job into a good company um one of the ways to be one of the ways is you know knowing people in that company networking right so what what do you think what should the youth do today to you know to help themselves that okay if i'm not from a good college good degree then and if i have skills i'm going to focus on my skills but how do i make myself visible got it there are multiple ways one you should definitely focus on the right skills okay. right so as a recruiter what are the three four things i will look at i will look at what you are claiming you know right i will look at proof that your claims are true and i will look at substantiation from other people that what you have shown me is correct mm. right so these are the three things um if you are from a great undergrad brand then some of these things are watered down and when you are you are willing to take that leap of faith you're willing to take that bet on the person but if you are not you will actually want to assess everybody on that For example, when you are hiring, you have a clear idea in your head that okay, these are the five skills I'm looking for. So you want the candidate to demonstrate that they know and they have used them. So I, I, what I do, I create an assignment from the step one. Exactly. Itself. Right. I don't want to read resumes. In the step one itself, I create an assignment. Uh, so a, a person who is doing the assignment itself is a very strong indicator for me of intent. Exactly. Right. And in that assignment, I get to see the skill set. Exactly. So so once they perform at a decent level. you will then ask them have you done it before as well yeah then they can show examples of projects that they have done right um i think what they can do is basically they can like be shameless right i think people shouldn't assume that things will be served on a platter to them they should reach out to people now linkedin is everywhere you should do cold reach outs right. you should say that i am learning this there are now multiple ways to learn online offline i don't think we need to go into that but once you've learned something how do you apply that you should reach out offer your services as a free intern if needed right. to somebody so that you get a chance to i, I actually i actually did that because i so badly wanted to get into management consulting of mbb um i reached out to the hrs of mckinsey vcg bain and on linkedin and i told them i'll work for free yeah. i reached out to the partners also i said i'll work for free the partner actually responded back and said uh, send me your resume Uh, I will send it to the HR. It didn't work out, but at least it, it the worked. process started. The process right? started, yeah. right? So you now, if I were to summarize what we have discussed so far, there are massive problems at two levels in the education funnel of India. One is at the undergrad level, where there are only five options for Indians, so they go through those five options. It's already very overcrowded, due to which they go to the second funnel of the education system, which is higher education. Higher education, the darling for Indian students today is MBA. Now, from what I understand, you guys are trying to solve that middle of the funnel. where there is a lot of people who have done undergrad don't know what to do out of their jobs because they're not doing what they learned for they're trying to get into mba not enough quality mba colleges available so there is an vacuum that is there in the education market today that needs to be solved so that is what i understand as the problem that you are solving varun if 
uh, you want to add some points over here no i I, th i think you nailed it i think the only thing is that at least when we were kind of exploring this problem one of the things that we realized what what you called the middle of the funnel uh, you know bottom of the funnel there aren't enough seats that help you differentiate from the middle of the funnel yeah uh, so there are a bunch when of people you mean bottom of the funnel you mean mba college seats anything that will get you there when uh, you mean there let's say define it as 20 lakh plus 20 lakh plus anything that can you know be something on your resume where people can just see it and go okay this is a person i'm going to give a chance to yeah uh and uh, you know historically it's it's usually been a degree and that's why the indian market has been a what we like to call a degree market you know people have paid for degrees yeah. the job to be done of higher education hasn't been getting the right experiences or getting the right skills but has been getting a degree because historically that has been something that has differentiated people on their resumes i think that is changing now because like ankit said earlier there are almost 80 lakh people who are getting degrees but less than 5% of them are probably getting jobs that are even paying them 5 lakhs or more and if i were to intervene here this mentality that degrees is the currency is little um, um incorrect right because degrees at the end of the day is a zero sum game because not if you because degree at the end of the day is just a, is reliant on the brand name of the college right now all colleges will not have a good brand name because only a few colleges get the fame other colleges become the long tail and i think we as indians have given all the importance just to the degree but it it was a zero sum game to begin with so not so not everybody can have that differentiating factor yeah. based on their college name no, so i mean you know there is also there is history to blame for this as well india is a young country there was a time when the number of jobs that were there in the market were more than the number of degree holders Okay. that's when uh, it it made sense to get a degree and hence you know whether you're going to get married or not uh, is is all going to be dependent on whether you had a degree or not and and that that is some kind of a hangover that the higher education system has had for a while and that's why the number of institutions also grew because they could monetize the degree now i think that that ratio is changing and it's changing drastically and it's becoming palpable So well, now the number of degree holders has increased and the jobs have risen drastically so much so that it's become palpable where people are now saying that there are so many degree holders but there aren't enough people who who are productive in their jobs or are people who are getting jobs hmm. for example if i were to quote a figure almost 70% of the employers when they hire freshers say that 70% of the freshers that they hire are people who are not employable that they hmm. need to actually train them and it's not a figure it's only for those colleges which are not in the top 10 this is a this is a figure for all young graduates mm. so i think essentially coming back to the incentives that ankit was talking about the incentives are not right incentives are not aligned for an institution to build a program to improve experiences or skills it's been aligned to provide degrees because that is what was monetizable so far mm. um and and that's where i think the problem lies the problem lies that there are far too many people in the country today uh, who are not able to break into these 0.5% top institutes in india because because there are only 0.5% uh, of these institutes in india which are high quality and hence they become a part of this really large undifferentiated pool of people but does that mean that they don't have talent absolutely not they do uh, what what me and ankit wanted to do was build something that can really allow these people to rise up differentiate themselves and get the kind of experiences and skills that are required for them to be productive in the ecosystem as a whole so can you now get into exactly what you guys do like mesa school of business but first tell me what mesa means so i think before we go there sharan just one one other point i'll add to what varun is saying so this is only from the student side okay right i think one would believe that if there are more people who want a job and there are less jobs then people who are giving jobs are happy yeah right because there are 10 people waiting to get a job then i will get the best person i can squeeze on right. the right no not not just the number but i on the quality right more importantly on the quality that if there are 10 people competing for one job then i will get the best candidate right i will get the most qualified candidate for this job i don't have to do anything because these people will fight among themselves to become better right but that's not happening so expanding on the number that varun said where employers feel that 70% of the fresh graduates are not employable which means that even because even with this imbalance 
of demand and supply, people are not getting the right skills. So while there are a lot of people who are hungry to get jobs, are hungry to get opportunities, there are a lot of employers who want to hire good people, there's a bit of a break in between. Uh, where they are not getting access to the right skilling pathways or the right skilling programs to become ready for the job they want and the employer is hence not able to get access to the rightly skilled and productive person who understands how the job is to be done. For example, let's say if I am now hiring somebody for data analyst role. Where do I go? Should I hire a BCOM? Hmm. Should I hire a, a, a BCA person? Should I hire a BSc person? I don't know. None of them is teaching how to do data analysis. Yeah. But that's what the job is today. Right? So then I will actually go to somebody who has done a course, maybe outside of their undergraduate, to learn how to do data analysis, how to use Excel, how to use maybe Tableau and all the other data tools and has done one or two projects and then I'll hire them. But there are nine other people who are maybe as good intellectually and, and, you know, and, and from a potential point of view, but they never got that chance. And uh, it's a very big problem from the employer side as well. And it's, it's also reflected in the fact that when, when uh, even after four years, spending your four years in undergrad, as soon as you join a new company, the company will put you through like six months of training. Yes. So why is that required? If, if there are four years of my you know, life that I'm spending on learning something, I should be learning what the industry requires. And there's a major gap there. There's a huge gap between what, what is being taught and, and what is useful in the industry, which, which needs to be solved ASAP. Let me give you one more example. Yeah. So HCL, like Infosys, Wipro are some of the biggest recruiters, right? Traditionally, they used to recruit from four year engineering programs. Now, but after that, they used to put them through a six to nine month of internal training. They started realizing that I can do the same thing with somebody who has not gone to a college. Mm. So they've actually set up their own academy called SCL Tech B. SCL? HCL Tech B. Tech B, okay, okay. What they do is they take students after 12th class. They put them through a one year program. Okay. And then after that, these students actually start working at HCL. So they save on three years. Yes. Then they get enrolled in an online program to get that degree because now government has also allowed online degrees after covid right. government actually came out with the regulation saying that the top thousand universities in the country can give online degrees except maybe a few degrees maybe only 10 percent like medical and maybe like a few engineering degrees are not allowed but almost 85 to 90 percent of all degree programs are now available online on government website anybody in india can get a degree now from let's say Delhi University in BCom. They don't have to go to a local university and spend three years there. They can do it fully online. That degree is acceptable everywhere. You can apply for masters with that. You can apply to government exams for that. You can apply for visas with that. Government has made online degree equivalent to an offline degree. Right. So the money that you were spending and the time you were spending in getting that offline degree, you don't need to do that now. You can actually do, you can spend that time learning and working. So SCL Tech B, if I don't, if I if I'm not wrong, last year they trained ten thousand students. Wow, from twelfth. From twelfth, and uh, they work the same. They they deliver the same work quality as the person who has done a four year engineering because that four year is not really helping them do better at job. Right. So I, if I were to give my own example, so when I finished my mechanical engineering, I got into KPMG and management consulting. So I thought I made it, right? It's a feeder college into good MBA colleges. I thought I'm gonna now start working with CXOs and CEOs and solve big problems like you said. Um, but the reality was very different. Once you get into consulting, then it's the battle of getting picked for projects. Now getting picked for projects, you need to have a good pedigree. I didn't have, the, I mean, there were other people from IMA as well, right? They were getting picked first. Uh, and also you need to have prior experience. I didn't have that. So I realized very quickly that I have been brought as a reserve person, right? Substitute. So sit on the, as, as a, you know, bench, bench warmer, yeah. right? Then they didn't really care. It was 30,000 rupees per month. I don't think they really cared about that being a dead weight. So I had to actively stay back. I used to like stay back late in the evening, only hoping so that I can go and go to the partner's cabin when after everybody has left, saying that uh, I want to work. Give me the next project that you're going in. 
And I told him, so there's something called credits, right? For utilization, that's how you're given your uh, ratings in uh, consulting. I said, I don't want utilization. Just put me on a project, I wanna learn. I, I like financial modeling, just put me on a project. So that's how I got my first project. Then I learned how to do Excel modeling, how to do a Tableau by myself. And back then, not many people knew Tableau. Yeah. So then I immediately became an asset. For the skill that I learned, not for the degree that I did. Absolutely. Right. So then I got one project after the other, and I was like, I reached hundred and five percent utilization. So I had hunger to. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I think an amazing example. Uh, and I think this problem is even worse for startups and new age companies because they need people with hunger, but they also need people with skills who can get job done. And the type of skills that are needed in fast-moving companies is also different, uh, and it keeps on changing or keeps on. I would say the list keeps on becoming longer and longer and longer with yeah. new skills getting added to it, right? So our current system is not at all geared towards creating highly job relevant skilled individuals and especially for fast growing startup new age companies. And this I think both of us experienced when I was hiring for Urban Company, when he was hiring for Amazon, it's, it was very difficult to hire. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the other side of the coin when you said that there's a problem on the student side, but there's a problem on the employer side as well. I mean, the higher education system is supposed to solve it for both. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's only solving for itself. So two problems, right? One is that the people who are graduating don't have the skills. They are in abundance. And it should have actually meant that the employees are having, um, you know, good time hiring. Good jolly time, right? Yeah, good jolly <laughs> time. But that is also not the case because you can't just hire anybody, right? So there is a huge problem that needs to be solved. So can you tell me how you guys are solving that problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I think, uh, like like Ankit said, the startup ecosystem is growing very fast. Uh, it's it's one of the ecosystems which is uh, most open to change. Uh, I I mean, if I were to like compare the ecosystem of any country, it's the first one that embraces change. Yeah. Um, it's probably the first one that is pro is 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 going to embrace the change that let's let's uh, hire for skills. Let's hire for expertise rather than degrees. Yeah. Um, and that's why we feel that while the startup ecosystem is growing very fast, it's facing the same problem that any other company is facing. They are not finding the right kind of skilled graduates that can really, you know, promote the entire startup ecosystem, that can create value. At the end of the day, only when a company or an ecosystem can create value is when jobs are created. When jobs are created is when more people enter this ecosystem and that's when the flywheel starts. Uh, so we feel that the startup ecosystem is going to face that problem and it's going to face that uh, problem in a, a plenty. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see that there are a lot of talented individuals out there uh, who are wanting a business education uh, to break into the startup ecosystem but are not able to go to traditional business schools. Number one, because traditional business schools are not uh, a plenty. Uh, there are only far and few that, that really give you the three things that are necessary out of higher education, which is brand, skills, and a job outcome. Uh, so, so that's where we come in. At least we believe that we can fast track this process. We can fast track the connection that is required between these talented, hungry individuals and connect them to the right startups and in between kind of create that bridge that is required to give them all the skills that are necessary for them to be productive in this startup ecosystem. And the way we are trying to do this is simple. We have worked backwards uh, from what the industry needs are. Uh, not by researching or, or by to just talking to these uh, people. Uh, the way we are kind of working backwards is by getting the industry involved in the teaching learning process. Uh, so, so rather than you know there being an academic pillar and there being an industry pillar, at, at MESA it's, it's all the same. We want people from the startup ecosystem who've been there and done that actually coming and teaching, number one. Can you, can you name some of these jobs that you guys are trying to solve for? I can name these jobs. Yeah, um, so in the beginning, the kind of jobs that we are going to be targeting are the ones that at least we felt there was the most palpable uh, need for in the ecosystem right now when we had conversations with 50 plus startup CEOs. These, these were roles that, that at least we like to call as organization building roles. These are roles where young graduates get to work directly with uh, CEOs, with SVPs. These are roles like founders office roles, 
product manager roles, PNL leader roles, marketing and growth roles, and so on and so forth. You know, here it's it's not about tactically doing a task. It's about understanding the big picture. Uh, it's it's about like taking a step back, taking strategic decisions for the entire firm. And this requires much more than just having one skill. It requires a much more holistic understanding of business, of startups, of themselves, of the ecosystem, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Interesting. One other thing that I wanted to add is that in, in our first avatar, we are solving for leadership roles in startups and new age companies. Uh, what that means is, uh, similar to what Varun said, these are organization builder roles. So you mean the jobs like um, uh, CEO's office role? Founder's office, role. entrepreneurs in residence, uh, you know, product team, uh, growth and marketing team, uh, PNL leaders. These are folks or these are the roles which will work uh, on some of the most pressing. Uh, so problems. if I may ask, what is the average pay in these kind of jobs? Uh, I think easily at least 20 lakhs. 20 lakhs. Uh, a year. Uh, as I said, these are fairly high value, high impact roles. And this is where they will actually get a chance to work with very, very senior leaders or even founders themselves. Uh, this is the role which also serves as the bench for future leaders in all the fast moving startups and new age companies. And this is where you actually get a 360 degree view of the business uh, yourself very, very early on. So this is sort of like being an entrepreneur in a company where you're not just like most people might assume that hey i go to business school and then um, if i'm not able to start a company by myself have i really made the best use of going to business school because business school means starting business right uh, but another way of looking at it looking at it is can i be a mini entrepreneur in another company right and that's the term that entrepreneur has been decided where i will act like an entrepreneur of one division of that company or one revenue stream of that company uh, because by doing this, I've taken lesser risk, right? Because I'm being mentored by the main founder exactly. who, who, who has figured out the shit. And then maybe two, three years later, once I'm comfortable, I can maybe start and be an entrepreneur Absolutely. myself. So Absolutely. that is the pathway. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples. At Urban Company, we used to hire and we still hire uh, entrepreneurs and residents. So a bunch of them actually have gone out and started their own companies now. Uh, some of them venture funded as well. Uh, because they got a chance to work on very, very challenging problems uh, with very smart people around them. And they got the right mentorship and the runway to fail right. and, and learn from that. And I think overall what we're trying to do, Sharan, here is not to get people a job. Mm -hmm. I think that is an outcome we are very confident that if we do our job, that will happen. But why, how are you so confident yeah. that? I think we are working backwards from creating an entrepreneurial mindset. Okay. okay. So graduating class at MESA should all have an entrepreneurial mindset. Now, that is basically a collection of competencies and skills that one should have if they want to succeed and thrive in a fast moving, fast changing environment. Now, some examples could be, you know, uh, or you know, some traits of somebody who, who has an entrepreneurial mindset is that they are dissatisfied. They, they challenge the status quo. They are excited about the impact of the work that they do, right? They're excited about getting their hands dirty. They're, they are very interested in, in solving big problems. Um, they make sure that they are running fast. Uh, they make sure that they are making best use of the resources they have because it's always resource constraint, right? When you're fast moving. Um, so those are people with an entrepreneurial mindset and they can thrive in two settings. One, they will thrive inside a fast moving organization with somebody who was given enough space to build a small part of the business or a business inside a business, right? They are called intrapreneurs. Right. Uh, so my role at Urban Company was uh, sort of an intrapreneur, right? Where while I, I wasn't leading the entire Urban Company, uh, I was still leading with a fair amount of space and freedom, multiple business lines. And I had a so chance- How many people were reporting to you as an entrepreneur in Urban uh, So I think by the time I left, I think my entire team was uh, close to 80 to 100 people. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's not any signal of how much value we were creating. But uh, ultimately, the idea is to, um, you know, solve meaningful problems. And being an entrepreneur, you still need that entrepreneurial mindset because why would a founder or a senior leader at a startup hire you? If I don't have that mindset. If you don't have that mindset because they don't want executors. They want people who can take on new challenges, new problems 
and run with it as if they are the founder of that problem, that they are the owner of that problem. Right. So I got the point about, you know, Mesa's focus on building that entrepreneurial mindset. But as a student, like when I'm evaluating a higher education uh, opportunity, uh, the job outcome is something that we are, it's, uh, you know, closely looked at, right? That is why, you know, employment reports is such a big factor. And that is what even I am, you know, uh, talk about in, you know, media and newspapers, right? Uh, this uh, particular student got a 50 lakh package or 70 lakh package. And that sort of builds the entire, um, uh, you know, the funnel for new students to join these institutes. Uh, so given that as the main uh, pain point or problem statement for most students today, considering higher education, um, how does MESA solve for that? Like, uh, like do you say ga job guaranteed or is that the right way to say it? Like, how can I as a student get that peace of mind that if I invest in a program like this, I'm going to be making a good, good, good living out of it. Like, how will I, can I get that guarantee that I can get a job or is it that I'll get, be infused with the skill set of getting the job? So how do you look at it? I mean, so we ideally want to first attract students who are very excited about working in a startup. We don't want to attract students uh, who want to work in large corporations, right? Because we, our curriculum is not designed for that. Right. Uh, so that's one. So it's not like for management consulting, investment banking. Yes. yes, our curriculum is not designed for that. And hence, anybody who has an aspiration to go there will not have the right experience. Right. right? So one, so number one is that, right? Second, we are also very clear that uh, we are not, it's not a program just to get a job. It's a program for life. Mm -hmm. And uh, these competencies that we talked about, the entrepreneurial mindset we talked about is basically our attempt in building a great foundation, which will allow them to jumpstart the next phase of their career. Right. Um, and they can continue to learn and compound on this foundation and continue to become successful more and more as they go along, either while working in great startups or launching their own startups as founders. We want them to have that confidence and that skill and competencies and that experience and network. Um, now, what exactly happens after 12 months or immediately after 12 months is something uh, which will vary for each student. So for some students, they want to get into a startup role. That's one outcome. For some students, they may want to continue to experiment and start something on their own. That's the second type of outcome. I think the way our program is designed is it's going to put you in front of 100 plus startup leaders and founders through the program, where they will come and teach you, where they will actually give you projects. So you will have enough and more chances to actually impress them. Right. And that's your first interview with them. Right. right? But one might argue that other colleges also have these sort of networking events that they organize with these startup uh, or company leaders, right? So how are you guys different? We, it's not a networking event for us. This is our program. Uh, so for a traditional school, most of the classes will be taught by an academician. And for a, from a networking point of view, they will have these events maybe a few times a year, where for a few hours, a lot of industry folks will come and interact with maybe 300, 400, 500 students at one time. For us, that's not the case. There's only a group of 60 students. Uh, and most of the workshops and most of the content is actually taught by industry practitioners or startup leaders and founders. When you mean industry practice practitioners, you mean people who are actually working at these startups. So if you want to learn marketing, right, who do you want to learn it from? Somebody who has never spent a dollar of marketing and, and run a campaign or somebody who runs large campaigns that you see every day on TV. Right. Uh, I think there is value for of both because if you want to learn foundations and concepts, uh, I think the top faculties in this country are amazing people uh, to teach you that. Uh, but when you want to apply them, uh, you need the help of people who are actually doing it on a daily basis. So that's one. You get in front of these people multiple times a day. Um, multiple times, multiple types of uh, leaders and founders. Second, we also make sure that you get assigned a mentor. Uh, it's a very individual mentor program. So based on your target industry and role, you have a mentor who can help you understand what type of industry it is, what type of role should you expect, how do you prepare for it, what do you need to do to be successful in the final role, right? Then there is more than 200 hours of career prep over and above the base program which is again personalized on your target roles. So depending on what we believe is specifically needed for you to be successful in the role that you're targeting, 
we will provide you with those resources. You know, it could be uh, interview prep, it could be communication coaching, it could be uh, case study preparation. Uh, whatever is needed for you to be successful in those roles will be provided over and above the core program, which will build that entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I actually don't feel that there's a risk of outcomes here because with our network, uh, one, we're only taking 60 students. Yeah. We are being very selective. Uh, so far, we've selected only 5% or less okay. of people who have applied. So our bar on quality is very high. That's why we wanted to limit it to only 60 students in the first cohort. We also have a lot of soft interest from founders and leaders who get excited on a daily basis when we share with them on what we are doing. Um, on engaging with these students. And I think our network, which we have built over a period of time, you know, through uh, my undergrad at IIT, HPS, um, our, our investment partners like Elevation Capital, they have a huge portfolio of companies uh, who will be interested in this. So because your investor, Elevation Capital, is a VC who has th hundreds of startups that they have funded, and because the outcome for your program is getting employed at these startups, you're saying that's an advantage for you. Exactly. We are India's and maybe potentially world's first VC funded business school. Wow. Um, and we wanted to be focused on startups. So we had to be funded by VCs. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't forget, uh, startups have a hard time uh, when it comes to hiring great people. Um, and they're always short of great people. Right. They're not short of people, they're always short of great people. And True. we are promising them great people. I don't think they will turn us away. They'll definitely give us the opportunity to present our candidates in front of them. And and just just one point to add to that is if, if you look at a traditional business school, you know, it's it's a two year program in which you study for like almost 16, 17 months, then there is something called as a placement season. Yeah. Like during the last three months, you're put in, uh, you know, almost like a show in front of employers and right. somebody will come and will choose you. Uh, what essentially we are doing is because our batch size is so small, it's just 60 students and the wide network that Ankit told us about exists, we put our students in front of their future employers on day zero. So rather than this being a process which is extremely accelerated and super risky at the end, right. students will get to interact with their future employers at day zero and will really get to understand what they will need to learn in the next 12 months to really land that dream job that they want to you know, land. So that's, that's what we do on day zero, we, we try to understand from these students what their target companies are, what their target roles are. And these are the kinds of people that we get to the program, whether it's via hackathons or whether it's them coming here and teaching or just general networking sessions. I think that's how we are fundamentally different. And like if you do the math, right, like you said, Elevation Capital has 200 plus portfolio companies. We've got five, six angel investors who've got more than 300 plus investments that they have made. Uh, we ourselves have a pretty strong network given Kellogg's network, IIT Bombay's network, Harvard Business School's network, but we have only 60 students. Yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, this is our founding cohort. So what MESA becomes in the future is, you know, dependent on the kind of outcomes that these 60 students get. Yeah. So we are going to put everything that we have our time, our money, blood, sweat, tears, whatever that needs to be put to make sure that these 60 students have outstanding outcomes because they are the ones who are going to be Mesa's brand ambassadors going ahead. And just to like follow up on that last point you asked, right? Where is there a job guarantee? Absolutely not. We fundamentally believe that's a wrong way. So you don't want people to come with a mindset that either I get to yeah. job pakka. You don't exactly. want such kind of no. people. We want people to come in knowing that there is no job guarantee. Because to your point, I think it, it attracts the wrong kind of students. Right. Uh, we want students, I think students are very smart. I think very discerning students who are very confident about themselves, who have high potential, they will ask tons of questions. We are happy to answer them. Right. To give them the right confidence that this program is the right program for them. And they have enough understanding to make a decision that will this program get me where I want to get to. And I will have to work hard to get. This program is not a pill or a vaccine shot. Mm. This program is an opportunity for students to get access to great network, great learning experience, great uh, peer group, and overall just a life-changing experience. Right. But they have to put in a lot of blood and sweat. Our average day is going to be 12 hour long. Wow. Right. How many days a week? Six days a week. Six days a week, 12 hours? 60 hour weeks. Okay. Uh, we want them to get used to yeah. working hard and easy. working smart.
right? Because the kind of jobs that they are targeting or whatever outcome that we want them to be hungry. We, don't, we yeah. won't, don't want them to slow down right now. This is not the time for like chill and watch Netflix. Uh, there'll, there'll be enough balance of fun and you know, like step back. It's not always going to be grinding, right? Yeah. Uh, because earlier when I was talking to you, Arun, in, in the campus, you mentioned that students spend only 25 25% of their time in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell is that about? Like 75% of the time, what are they doing? I, I mean, you know, while Ankit was saying that this is extensive, you know, in the general sense, people might feel that, oh, that means that students are going to be spending eight hours to nine hours a day sitting in lectures. I think we are opposed to that. Uh, we, we strongly believe that nobody can understand business building by sitting in a lecture. So we have flipped the classroom model. Uh, our students spend less than 25% of their time sitting in a lecture. In the remaining 75%, what they end up doing is building their own businesses, mm. which is an extremely hands-on approach to really understanding what it takes to, you know, start a business and take it from like zero to one. Uh, number two, they will be interacting with a lot of people in the startup world who've been there and done that, understand their journey, create really strong networks that are required for them to, you know, land those dream jobs. They'll be participating in a lot of boot camps, workshops, hackathons, will be like, one to two day really extensive sessions where they will be given an input, they'll have to work in groups, they'll have to present something to a industry practitioner and an industry practitioner who's been there and done that will give them feedback on it. Mm -hmm. So we at least believe that the lecture model is broken. Uh, so while days are going to be super long, they are going to be super interesting. And, and, and that's the way we want it to be because lectures are boring. It's as simple right. as that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and besides that, it's not only about learning about business or being able to execute that. It's about having a very strong personality. It's about building a winning mindset, about being extremely positive in life. So besides these lectures from top academicians, from top B schools in India and abroad, and besides industry practitioners, uh, which are startup leaders coming to our campus, we'll also have a lot of people like army veterans coming down to teach students about leadership. Uh, a very famous uh, comedian coming down to take and uh, take a session on improv. Okay. Um, a sportsman coming down to share what 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 it takes to build a winning mindset among students. So it's going to be a very different experience, a very different energy, a very different vibe, and that's that's why we like to believe that we are very different from a traditional business school, and and that's why we believe that you know business education in India needs to be changed, and this is the way to do it. So I'll, I'll give you one example, right? So how do you want to learn sales? How do you think one can learn sales? Do you think you can learn sales by reading 10 business cases uh, and thinking about all the strategies? Or the thing is picking up the phone and start dialing. Yeah, doing sales. <laughs> so the way we will teach sales, and there's no just one sale, right? You, you have B2C, B2B, product, service, uh, low price, high price, uh, like economy, premium, right? Um, in person, online, on call. So we'll just get students to do sales. Wow. Uh, so you learn concepts. First, you understand what you need to be careful about, right? Then you start doing sales. You pick this cup and show me how to sell 100 of these cups. You have Bangalore, you have this budget. I don't care how you sell it. I don't care if you sell it to one person or on traffic light or on a call. Sell 100 cups, make some money. And then you come back and tell me what's working, what's not working. Then we have actual sales leaders come in wow. who run large sales organizations day in, day out. And then they will tell you what are the strategies that they thought work. You will tell them what, what worked for me, what didn't work. You will hear your peers say and share and you will learn from each other. And then you go back and sell more cups. And then you come back again and interact, again interact with that sales leader who again does it day in, day out. Uh, and then that's how you sort of pair the theoretical concept with application and then round it off with immediate feedback from people who are actually applying it day to day. And just a very small example, you can apply it to marketing, you can apply it to product building. Uh, if you're, let's say, in a product management class, can you read about product management? No, right? You can read only to a fair bit. And then after that, why don't you go and build a product? Uh, and then come back and see how, and, and tell us how many users used it. Um, and what was their feedback, you know, go and speak to customers, write a product document, whatever, do whatever it takes. And that's the entrepreneur mindset. That's the, that's the doer mentality. That's what we want. That's our program is designed to build. Interesting. So what you're saying makes a lot of sense, right? It, it's 
very very logical but why do you think that other colleges are not doing this and uh, what makes you feel like you are the right person to do it like how would you think that you guys will be the ones who to implement it the right way because it seems obvious other colleges should be doing it they are not doing it why are you doing it and why you guys are the best at doing it i think couple of thoughts there one i think we have a very strong conviction that this is the right way maybe others have a strong conviction that what they are doing is the right way right uh, and that is yet to be seen but we have a very strong conviction that you can only learn by doing and we have enough examples in our life where we have seen people learn new skills and we have also learned new skills by doing rather than reading about them or listening about them right uh, so we have a very very strong conviction and i think this is now being echoed across uh, the academic halls also right how do we bring in more and more uh, elements of application uh, into the program into all programs so i think there is a bit of a wave of change also it will it will take some time there are these legacy institutions which are great they have something which is working for them for whatever reason and you know it, it, there is there is always inertia to change it's only a new age institution like ours which is trying to disrupt will be the first to change right and uh, we'll set the road map so you think this will be a disruption we think it will be that's i think that's one second um it's difficult to do it honestly 100% uh, because it has not been uh, done before uh in this setting it has been done i mean there are enough examples right everybody who joins a company goes through a training program yeah that is an example of this so an H, if you go to hul they'll train you on a sales program that's basically a hands on sales program you are basically a sales apprentice you are being taught a few hours a week you go and do some sales you learn from your mentor on how do you how could you have done better and then you do it the next week and that's basically a micro program of our entire program right right uh, so it is being done inside companies but not yet inside institutions so we want to bring that out of the company and do it inside uh, a, a program why are we the right people i think couple of reasons why why we believe that we are the right people one we are super passionate about this problem i think uh, we have experienced this problem on multiple levels both as employers and as students uh, and we want to solve this problem second the way we think is very industry backwards and outcome backwards so all of our program design is not because that is how it is done in the world every decision that we have taken about the program every design choice is rooted into an outcome at the end of the program so if there is anything that doesn't make sense even if it's the most popular thing we will drop it because we have to strongly be convinced that it is going to help the student and the employer so we believe we are able to take those decisions because again we are new right we don't have any legacy or baggage to hold us back uh, we are also very agile so our team is actually going the entire learning and experience team is going to be situated or co-located in the same campus as the students right. so we are actually going to get daily feedback from students on what's happening what's not working and we can actually make changes if not on a day we can make changes in 10 days mm -hmm. to what's working and what's not working so this entire mindset like the entrepreneurial mindset or the startup agile mindset doesn't exist in legacy institutions we are bringing that to the, like the outcome backwards agile open to feedback and overall passion about just the problem and the customer customer for us is student and the employer hmm. i think we have that over the legacy institutions and i'll i'll just add to that like if if you look at traditional business schools um, i think they do a good job of preparing say talent for mncs and consulting firms uh, probably what they require there is is much more theoretical concepts uh, that need to be implemented i think when it comes to the startup world the kind of skills or experiences required are fundamentally different you require to be somebody who's been there and done that uh, who knows how to implement who's okay with failure who's open to feedback and so on and so forth i think right now what is happening is that traditional business schools don't have strong relationships with startups and and it's a very logistical reason and i can give you an example of like even kellogg so kellogg what happens is placement starts in january by march it closes uh but we end up joining our companies in september or august right but what happens is startup hiring for a role that is opening in august can only start in july because they do just in time hiring mm. so students if they are graduating of a out of a traditional business school whether it iims have to wait 
till July if they want to get a job in a startup. And hence the incentives of traditional business schools are to design a program such that people are successful in the MNC environment or, or say in, the, in consulting firms. But nobody is thinking about startups. Uh, and that's why we feel that this is a major gap that exists there. And why are we the best people to do it? At least we believe that to solve this problem, it cannot be solved externally. It has to be solved by the startup ecosystem for itself. Uh, and that's why we are like a business school that has been built by the startup ecosystem for the startup ecosystem. And that's why we believe that that's the only way that this problem can be solved. And why do you think we are in Bangalore? We could have chosen to be in Mumbai. We could have chosen to be in Gurgaon, right? Uh, he moved from Mumbai to Bangalore. We wanted to be here in the middle of the startup ecosystem. And that's why our campus is in Bangalore, is in a WeWork where there are 50 other startups around us. Right. So we have to be close enough. All right, guys, I think that is the perfect note to kind of um, end the session. Um, I think, personally, I felt like this is something very, very new, of course. I have not heard of something like this before. I mean, there are many players which are uh, creating a version of this, but I think something which is so well thought out, I mean, when you explain to me about, uh, uh, for example, that uh, experiment, no, sorry, the, the example of selling these cups, that really, you know, got to me. I mean, I would love to, you know, be in a... Uh, program like that where I'm taught how to where I have to figure out my, by myself how to sell this cup come back and ask sales leaders is this the right thing to do and ask my friends as well is this the right thing to do sounds like a very very uh, interesting and uh, out of the box approach so I think uh, my bet is on you I hope you guys make it really big I think your first batch is starting uh, very very soon yeah. uh, so we'd love to know how you guys progress and let's see if we can have another conversation again and to see how the outcome has been out of your, uh, you know, the first batch. All right, is there anything else that you would like to end the discussion with? No, I think uh, it has been a great conversation, Sharon. Thank you for having us and asking all the right questions. Uh, I think overall, we are very excited about uh, this program. And uh, Varun and I, I think once our program starts, I think are going to invest almost all of our time yeah. with these 60 students and the program itself. Uh, in making sure that this becomes the envy of the world nice. uh, and we are able to create a, a life-changing experience for these uh, for these 60 hand-picked students uh, so yeah I think, I think safe yeah. to say we are beyond excited yeah I wish we had something like this yeah I, I felt the same and I'm excited for you guys to see how it turns no, no, I mean yeah there are so many people out there who are going to be watching this podcast who have the talent that is necessary but just because the cat was this one day yeah. test that they could not crack, uh, like the way I could not crack it uh, or cracked it, but still could not get in. Uh, there are so many people out there who cannot get into the IMs uh, or, or, you know, maybe even ISB, but they've got a lot of talent. Uh, we call these people to apply because our program is unique. Uh, I think it can give them that edge that is required for them to be truly successful and truly be out there as startup leaders that can push India's ecosystem ahead. Yeah. Uh, so our first batch is starting September 2023 and we have our applications that are open. So anybody who's willing to apply wants to get in touch with us. Our admissions process is very personalized. We speak to each and every candidate. So reach out and we would be more than happy to speak to you. Awesome. Awesome guys. On that note, let's wrap up today's uh, session and I will see you in the next one.